Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see uh, familiar faces and also to see amazing members of our student body here. Um, I just want to take a brief moment to thank Jennifer, a member of our lower school, who has brought our guest speaker today, um, Tony. Um, one of the wonderful things about the Speaker Series program is that we have um, many speakers come, but sometimes the remarkable part is that they are an extension of our own network. And so Jennifer and Tony have known each other for a number of years. And so without further ado, and without stealing the show, I'd like to um, introduce a, member, a valued member of our teaching and learning community. Thanks. So welcome. Some of you, I see some faces that may know me as Miss Russell and Miss Young. <laughs> You're like, who is this teacher? But I am so honored to have my friend Tony Lee here. I've known Tony. We grew up together in the same small town. And he is truly, <coughs> when you know our motto of inspiring greatness for a better world, Tony is that person. You could pick his brain and have him come and speak to you about a plethora of things. He grew up in our homogeneous small town in Tennessee and was on a state winning soccer team. He is every sport you can imagine. He rock climbs, snow skis, scuba dives, triathlete. He is also an avid world traveler. You're not in the country, and in the state's very long at all. You're always all over the place. He has the most amazing pictures. And he is not only a wonderful person and a friend, but also an extremely successful businessman. He has worked to invent, and I'm probably gonna pronounce it all wrong, but valves to, uh, for hearts, for, and he's worked with corneal um, devices to help with blindness. So he would be a great person for innovation lab. Also, if Matt Evadonzio wants to steal him, he might <laughs> want to go do that this afternoon. But four years ago, or five years ago, he had a life-changing event that um, he's going to share with you his story and his inspiration. And when I first heard of this and talked to Tony afterwards, I, I knew that he was going to be the guy that's going to invent things. He has several patents. And he was going to help others, whether it was helping military members have lost arms or legs. I knew he's the guy that's going to use this to serve and help others. And he has done that, and I'm gonna let him share with you what he's doing today after his turn of events five years ago. So, Tony, welcome. And How's everyone doing? Good. Uh, I've been looking forward to this talk. Uh, and uh, I'm a little bit nervous, because normally when I talk, I, uh, I speak to and full bankers and things like that, and we're talking about companies or things. And it's a lot easier for me to talk about stuff like that. Today, we're going to talk about myself and about what happened to me. And um, it uh, is, I just passed the four year anniversary four days ago. And uh, every year on October 17th, my hands get a little clammy and it's a little tough. But um, you know what? And this is actually the very first time I've talked in front of an audience. Well, uh, Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to sometimes be in, on the stool here because um, I still have some issues with my legs and so it, it hurts me to stand for long periods of time. So I'll kind of intermittently be in the stool. Um, but our, our story here starts uh, four years ago, October 17th. Um, and what you're looking at here are uh, a pair of islands called the Mokes. And they are about a mile offshore. In, they're in Hawaii, and they're about a mile offshore of Oahu. Uh, that that's that's Oahu, and the Moks are right. These two islands, right? Oh, these two islands right here. Um, and like I said, they're about a mile offshore, and it's pretty popular for guys who are training for triathlons to uh, swim to these islands. It's a mile there, around the island, and then a mile back. And it makes for around 2.4 miles, which is exactly the length of a Ironman swim run, swim second. And so lots of guys do it. And uh, this is me and my buddy Maz. Uh, this was another time we swam to the island, uh, and we, uh, we 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 swim there all the time. And uh, so you can see the this is from the island, and that's the shore. So this is from a drone uh, shooting that way, and you can kind of get get an idea of the distance. Um, 
So on the day of the uh, on the day of the attack, um, we started in the morning, and we had uh, swum out to the island, uh, and we had just finished our roundabout, and we were on our way back. Um, and between the two islands, there's a pretty good rip current, and so one of the things you do is you just swim really hard because if you stop swimming there, the current takes you away. So you don't you don't stop for people. You, you just keep going till you get to the open channel in the middle. Once, once you get in the open channel, the current kind of dies down, and then you can kind of wait for each other, and, and, and everyone can catch up. So I was about 100 yards ahead of Maz, and uh, I'd gotten to the open channel, and so I saw that I was way ahead of him, so I was just kind of swimming slowly and just, just kind of relaxing. And it's so beautiful to swim in Hawaii. Um, the, the water's clear. It's about 30, 40 feet deep, and you can see right down the bottom. A lot of times there's sea turtles, there's lots of coral, there's beautiful fish everywhere. It's just wonderful. Um, on this particular day though, uh, it was a little cloudy. It rained the night before and it was a little murky and that was one of the key things I should have thought about because um, shark attacks happen a lot more when in, in murky water than in, uh, than in clear water. So anyway, I was uh, swimming along and all of a sudden I felt, uh, felt something grab both my legs and grab them hard and my first thought was that, uh, that maybe somehow Maz had caught up to me and he was just kind of messing with me and grabbing my legs. Uh, but then, uh, then the pain started. And, uh, boy, <laughs> it's hard for me to describe what that felt like. I mean, it, uh, it, was, uh, it was the most excruciating thing I've ever felt in my life. Uh, and, well, there are a lot. Uh, anyway, um, and, uh, and, and then I looked back, and all I could see was just teeth. I mean, it was, uh, it's, it, it, uh, it just, when, when you're looking down the barrel of the gun, you just, all you just see is the teeth. And, uh, and so I, I realized that there, you know, there was gonna be a real problem. Um, and so I, it had, the shark had both my legs in its mouth, and it was a very large shark. I did find out later uh, it was a female shark. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll get to this later in the story, but it turns out there's not a lot of people who survive shark attacks. And when, when someone does, all the shark experts of the world want to contact you. And so I was feeling phone calls and everyone was coming because you know uh, there were still a lot of shark's teeth in my legs and stuff, so they were analyzing and they could figure out what kind of shark it was, how big the shark was. And we do know it was a female shark and the estimation is that she had just had a child. And so when they pup, uh, they are very hungry. They need a lot of calories and they will eat anything. And in fact, they have found uh, full car tires inside the inside female sharks after, after pupping because they're just so hungry, they'll eat. They, they, their mind doesn't quite work very well, never seen anything. Um, so anyway, she had grabbed on both my legs and I was swimming freestyle, so think about it legs were grabbed, and, um, and then she started pushing me down uh, deep. Uh, I was able to grab one good breath, um, but then, sorry. Should've done that, that was, that's one on one. <laughs> Turn off the phone before you start talking. Okay. Um, yeah, so she started uh, to push me deep, and uh, luckily I had a pretty good breath of air, and I was punching at her from behind, uh, and I can tell you, I, it wasn't doing much. Um, I read in a book, uh, this was long before, I read in books that if you punch a, the, the, the shark's nose has a lot of nerves in it, if you punch the, the, right in the nose, that, that well, I'm here to tell you from personal experience, that does not do anything. <laughs> Punched her right in the snout and nothing happened. Um, they had pictures of my hands uh, after, you know, in the emergency room afterwards. Uh, I guess that's the spoiler, I do live. Um, <laughs> but they had pictures of my hands and uh, you could see all my, all, all my knuckles had split and uh, the bones were showing in all my knuckles because I'd just been punching her so much and it just wasn't doing anything. Um, I'm sorry if this gets a little scary, guys. I know there's some some kids here, and so uh, I'll, I'll keep try to keep it as as, as uh, kid friendly as possible. Um, 
And uh, so she kept pushing me deeper, and at some point I, hear, I heard my, felt my ears uh, pop, and so I knew I was pretty deep. Uh, and that's when I started to think, oh, th this, is, this is pretty bad. Um, and I guess I called, at that point I called a lucky break because uh, my, my left leg broke. It just came apart, came off. And so that allowed me, you know, when you have two legs, uh, you can't turn, you can't do anything. But when one leg breaks, now you can swivel. And that allowed me to swivel and face her. Um, and, and I remember also reading somewhere that their gills are weak and you can attack the gills. And so I punched her gills and then I pushed my fingers in there and that, once again, does nothing. Uh, it did not stop her. Um, and, uh, and that's when I looked and right above her, when I, I had both my hands on her gills, her eyeballs right above that. And I guess I should stop a little bit and explain what I do for a living. Um, I run biotech companies, and my most recent biotech company, uh, we're working on a biosynthetic cornea. Now the cornea is the front part of your eye. It is a clear, uh, it's a clear thing that you see through. And when you put your contacts in in the morning, you are touching your cornea. Now, there are 15 million people around the world who uh, have lost their cornea and are blind due to their cornea. It is the third leading cause of blindness in the world. At this point, the only solution for that is transplant. Um, now, transplant is tough because you have to get there when the, uh, the original donor passes. You have to get there within an hour of death. And you have to cut the cornea out and you, have to, you can preserve it. And uh, you can preserve it for right about a week. Um, so you have to find a match within that week. So because of, you know it's such a difficult thing, um, there are only about 60,000 transplants available a year. And 15 million people, but only 60,000 transplants. So you can see there's a pretty big gap there. Um, so our company had developed a way to grow corneas in a lab. And so that's what we were working on out in Hawaii. And so we were working on this, this way to, to tissue engineer these corneas together. Um, and what we would do is we would test these corneas on pigs uh, you, because you have to kind of, you, you, you install the cornea and you have to check it to see if it, it has enough strength, tensile strength and enough uh, impact resistance to last inside a human being. Um, and so pig anatomy is really interesting. They have three eyelids. They have the regular eyelids that you and I know and then they have a third eyelid that goes across the side. And that's called a nicotinating membrane. Now, what a nicotine membrane is, is it's a protection for the eye. So kid, pigs like to run through brush, and they run through all these uh, brambles and all these things that scratch people's eyes. And so what happens for them is they put this nicotine membrane across, and that allows them to run through there, and they don't get any scratches on their cornea. And that's why, like so a lot of times in Hawaii, there's a lot, of pig, a lot of feral pigs running around. But the dogs love to chase the pigs, but dogs don't have that membrane and they get caught in these brambles and unfortunately these dogs you know, get scratches on their cornea and, and it's, it's not a pretty thing. Um, but anyway, so in our, in our practice what we have to do is we have to, we, we, we have to take these pigs, pigs' eyeballs out, sorry kids, uh, and, um, and there's a certain method we used to do that. And so here I was holding the sharks by the gills and looking right up at her eye and I saw her blink and I saw the third membrane go across. I thought, oh my gosh, their eyes exactly like the pig's eyes. And so I did what I do for the pigs. You pry them open with your fingers, push the, pull. The, now the nicotine membrane is very strong if you, uh, if you push it like this, but it slides really easily right across. So I pulled the eyelids open, slid the nicotine membrane across, and then you push on the medial aspect, just toward the middle of the eye, and the eyeball pops right out. Just so you know. <laughs> I guess you can learn something today. But um, then I just grabbed it in my hand and ripped it right out. And uh, at that point, uh, she, uh, she let go of my legs, or my one leg that was left. Um, and that is the last time I saw her. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was kind of freaking out a little bit. Um, and I. So I started to swim back toward the surface. Uh, it was pretty deep. And I, my legs were just not working. And so I was just kind of pumping my arms and pumping. And, uh, and I can tell you, I, I just kept looking up and seeing the surface, and it just wasn't getting any closer. And I pulled and pulled and, until uh, 
until finally I broke broke air and broke the broke the surface. And I I never enjoyed a breath of air more than that that moment. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, it's pretty amazing to get a breath of air. Um, so I, I looked around, and I, I didn't see anyone else. I saw Maz about 50 yards back, but and I looked, and I realized we were still about half a mile from shore. Um, but originally I had a circle on there, but it, about right in the middle of the channel, right there. And I kind of did a little assessment, a little situation assessment. Uh, here I was, I was in the water. Um, my legs didn't work very well. There was blood everywhere. I was bleeding out, and there was long trails of blood. And uh, I was about half a mile shore, and there were, I knew there was at least one shark in the, out, in the water, and she probably wasn't too happy with me. Um, so <laughs> just started yelling out for help. Uh, it, was, it would have been closer to swim back to the island, but once you get that island, you can see there's nothing on that island. So uh, I knew that if I went to that island, I'd probably just probably perish on that island. So I decided to start swimming back towards shore. So I laid on my back and so I could still yell, and I started backstroking back towards shore, hoping that Maz would eventually catch up with me. And I did that for about five minutes, and um, you know, I still think it's kind of a miracle. You know, I, all of a sudden I heard someone call back, because I was just yelling, help, help, and I heard someone call back. So I stopped swimming, I looked up, and right out of the blue, and I had sworn I looked there just 10 minutes earlier and there was nothing there. But there was a guy, two, two boats, two, uh, two outriggers. Oh, that's a bigger tire shark. That's how big they get. That's nuts. Uh, this is not a bigger shark that attacked me. This is a picture from a file photo. But um, you can see the um, shark that attacked me was 15 feet. This one is 17 feet. So. It, oh, it's a uh, little, little bit difference in, in height, and, and, but it's around that size. And that's what an outrigger looks like. They're little racing boats. And uh, it was a man, Charlie Liverton, and his son, who was uh, 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 Julian and Charlie. And uh, Charlie was only uh, 12 years old at the time. And so probably the age of some of y'all. But uh, Charlie was extremely brave that day, and he saved my life. Um, so what happened is, uh, Julian, I got aboard Julian's boat, I just laid across where their feet are, and uh, the back of all my shoulders, and I put uh, the stubs that I had left, I put up against the pontoon, and Julian started to paddle. And Charlie went to go get my friend Maz, who was still in the water, about 50 yards back, and uh, pick him up. Um, and Charlie and Maz, because um, I was having trouble balancing and I kept kind of falling off, and uh, so it took us a while to get to shore. But um, Charlie and, uh, and Maz got to shore first, and immediately they, uh, they, called, they called an ambulance. And that really saved, you know, saved my life. Um, so uh, he was only 12 years old, and a really brave kid. 12 years old, didn't panic, stayed with it, focused, and, uh, and really, uh, really came through. Um, so we're, I was in the boat with Julian, and we were slowly coming back, and at the time I was bleeding out, and we had taken this rash guard, and, and we had wrapped a tourniquet the best we could, but, you know, I remember as a kid reading a book, uh, you know, and I, I've been looking for it, I can't remember the name of that book, but it described someone who was, uh, was bleeding to death, and they talked about things getting cold, and, and things, you know, fog trip, getting sleepy, and, I didn't feel that at all. <laughs> yeah, I didn't feel. Um, I, well, I was in Hawaii, so I wasn't cold. Um, but you know, the the biggest thing you feel is you, you feel shortness of breath. You slowly, um, because as you guys will learn in health class, the blood it carries uh, blood cells, red blood cells, hemoglobin, and that carries oxygen around your body. And so, um, if you don't have enough blood, you're not getting oxygen to your body. And as, so as slowly you're bleeding, you just start losing oxygen. And no matter how hard you breathe, you just feel more like you're suffocating very slowly, uh, like someone's putting a bag on your head. And, oh, I tell you, 
that was a tough feeling. Um, uh, and uh, that little that, that ride back to the uh, to shore probably only took like 10, 15 minutes, but but it sure took, felt like it took forever. Um, and uh, we finally got to shore, and luckily Charlie and Matt had gotten there first, and they called the ambulance. Interesting side note, but um, uh, the, this is the east side of Hawaii. It's pretty rural over here, and there's only one ambulance. And five minutes after Charlie called, um, somebody else called for an, for, uh, an accident up on the northeast side. And so if Charlie had, hadn't gotten there in time when he did, um, that ambulance would have been heading north. And at which point, that's how Charlie saved my life. Because he, he didn't dawdle at all. He got there. He got right on his paddle, and he got right home. And so that was important. Other interesting side note. This is, uh, this is I tell you, this, this story gets really crazy. So it's, if you all have ever seen, there's a TV show on ABC a couple years ago called Lost. You know, it was about a couple people on an island. So there was an actor on the show by the name. Uh, he was a, kind of a, a rotund gentleman. Uh, his name, on the show they called him Hurley. Uh, his name in real life is uh, Jorge Garcia. Well, crazy enough, Jorge owns one of those houses right there. And he was standing on the beach when, when Charlie came in and he's the one that called uh, 911. So, can you believe that? Hurley is the guy who called 911. Yeah, gets nuts. Anyway, I finally get to shore and, uh, and uh, so, uh, I've been around, uh, been around medicine my whole life. Uh, uh, spent some time in med school, and I know some things. Some things that, if once you get uh, to an ambulance, your chance to survive goes up to almost fifty percent. Once you get to a hospital, your chance to survive goes up to almost ninety-five percent. Um, I think we're out of batteries. That's all right. I knew that it was important that I stay awake until we get to the hospital, and. Uh, and I also knew that if I panicked, then um, that um, shock would set in. And so the trick was to remain calm and to stay awake. Um, and so the, the ambulance finally got there. And, uh, and you, when you start to desaggregate, that, that's what, segregation is, is, is the Latin of the blood. And so when you start to lose your blood, um, if your heart has nothing to pump, it'll go into fibrillation. Now your heart normally beats in this nice rhythmic fashion like this. Um, fibrillation, it, it goes all cattywampus. It does this weird little blood thing. And that is really bad because uh, you're, then you're not pumping blood. And so um, the first thing the ambulance had to do is get some, uh, get, to get some, some kind of fluid in my body. So they get some saline. And so the, the, uh, the EMT, he understood that. And what he was trying to do was trying to put a line in. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever given blood, uh, but in order to do that, they have to put a line in. I did notice that um, there's a blood drive next week. So take note of that. Um, so the, the gentleman, the ENT, was trying to, they had me in the ambulance. It was probably in the upper 90s in temperature, so everyone was hot. And by that time, several hundred people had gathered from the beach, and they were all standing around. and. And they were wondering why the ambulance was just sitting there. But the ambulance, the EMT understood that once they started driving, there was no way he was going to be able to stick that. And so he was just trying to get that needle in to, into my vein, and which is hard enough in a normal environment. But to do it when my veins had collapsed because there was no blood in them, and to do it in 100 degree heat with 100 people watching you and yelling at you to get going, I remember looking at his eyes, and his whole face was just sweating. And I thought, wow. Well, he's in a rough spot. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but he did finally get in, and then we did start going, oh, thank you. Hello? We, and then we did start going, and uh, we went to the airport, and we headed toward the hospital. And I could see through the uh, skylight, and the uh, ambulances don't have windows, but they do have a skylight. I threw the skylight where we were, and the minute I saw the awning for the hospital, I knew I was going to live. And so that's, I just passed out right then. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, went to a couple days of, uh, well, about three days of surgery uh, and about uh, a month of different uh, random uh, different surgeries and recoveries. 
uh, and put a couple things on it. And I, I forgot to mention that one of my feet had come off, but um, when I was sitting there treading water, the, a foot floated up right next to me. And my first thought was, oh, somebody out here lost a foot. <laughs> and I realized it was my own. And so I stuffed it into my waistband. And uh, so it was my waistband, luckily. And so they, re that's this one right here. They reattached it. I actually have pictures of it, but I have saved it to the very end because I know there are kids here, so I won't show those to anyone. Um, but yeah, it's pretty freaky. Um, so anyway, they were able to reattach the leg. And that's a picture of me at, 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 at Queens Hospital. I've been uh, in a hospital room uh, for uh, eight weeks, and uh, I've been immobilized because they were trying to get my leg to set. And at eight weeks, they let me get in a wheelchair, and they pushed me outside. That was the first time I've seen daylight and sunshine in eight weeks. <laughs> Pretty happy. Um, that was a good day. Um, and then came the long process of learning how to walk again. Um, and so you've noticed on my right leg, this is a prosthetic leg. Uh, there's two parts to it. Top part is a socket, and that's what it interfaces with the stump that I have left. I'll do this. Some of y'all probably haven't seen this before. So this is the stump I have left. That's what's left. And then this is what's called a liner. And this is kind of made, it's kind of very similar to scuba material. And um, it's what allows you to wear your leg comfortably. Now in the old days, and I say old days, it was only 20 years ago, what, they, what folks would do is they would just stick their foot, their leg directly into this thing. And those guys were tough because this thing rubs like crazy. You know, it just, but, um, but nowadays we're lucky we have these nice little liners that, that make it a lot more comfortable. And then the leg goes right on. On top of it, and there you go. And so that's the socket. The sockets are made to fit your, you, your particular person. Every person has to have their own special socket. And they take a moldy stump and they fit the socket around it. Now the leg on the bottom, that's where the fun part is. Now this leg is um, from a company called Freedom Innovations. It's a carbon leg and has a little bit of a bend to it. But me being an engineer, I figured, well, we can do all sorts of other different kinds of legs. Um, this leg is made for walking uh, and being comfortable, so there's a little bit of a spring to it um, that allows you to walk. Now, when you normally walk, uh, the, there are different steps of the different uh, uh, portions of a, of, a, of each stride. There's a heel strike, where your heel strikes, and you roll. At the very end, there's a kick, and that's what your, uh, that's what your calf does. Your calf does that kick. Well, we don't have calf muscles. And so we don't get that little spring you get on each step. And that's, what the, that's why these legs have a little spring built into them. So that gives us a little bit of a spring when we walk. And it's very noticeable, because when you wear a leg that doesn't have that, you really, really notice it. And you feel it's really hard to walk. Um, so this is one of, uh, one of the physical therapists that was helping me stand up. And that's my first day walking. Um, and being an engineer that I am, I decided that I would try to build other legs to do other things. Now, um, because of the Gulf War and the other subsequent wars we've been having, um, there have been a lot of folks, a lot of amputees. And so the U.S. military has been putting a lot of money into, uh, into uh, prosthetic research. They are really focusing on being able to walk, which I have been beneficiary of all that research. But they don't have special leg, but they're assuming guys just want to get up and walk around. And for me, getting up and walk around is not enough. So I wanted to be able to have special legs for special things. When I was a kid, I used to watch this cartoon called uh, Inspector Gadget. And this guy had these cool little gadget arms and gadget legs and he could do all sorts of cool stuff. And I thought, you know, I can do stuff like that. I'm an engineer. I have an entire prototype lab at my office. And so I started making legs to do different things. Here's my climbing leg. It's hard to see it really very well, but it's the one on the right, and that's me up the wall. 
And then, well, that's my CrossFit leg. Um, it's a little stronger, it doesn't have as much spring and more stability because for, for lifting weights. Um, that's a surfing leg. Um, it's, uh, now, the, the, kick, the, tr the uh, trick to a surfing leg is, is I'm regular footed. So, do any of y'all surf? Any you guys surf out there? This is La Jolla, right? You guys got to surf. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, you, how many of you guys are regular foot? Yeah, how many you goofy? Okay. So, I'm regular foot, right? So, the trick, the, everything comes from your back foot, right? To be able to turn, you got to be able to move, right? Now, leaning forward was okay because if, just think about the way your foot works. When you lean forward, you push on your, on your, on the, uh, on the, the balls of your foot, and it makes the surfboard turn, and that allows you to turn the surfboard. My, and then when you want to go the other way, you bring your surf, your, you bring your, uh, your foot up. That's called dorsiflexion. But you bring your foot up like that, and that causes your surfboard to bend this way, and that allows you to turn this way. But because I can't move my foot, my foot is locked in position. Uh, I can lean forward with my knee to force the right turn, but I can't turn left. So what I did was, man, I really wish I had a picture of it. Uh, my circle looks like a T. So it comes down from my, and then where the ankle is, it tees off equal distance from the back. So now when I lean back, I can bend the board to make the board turn left. Yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah, it's not a great picture, but Access Surf, they're, they're another great organization uh, that helps folks get back out there. Uh, and then went back to swimming. To swim the, uh, and I should mention this too. I don't want to make people afraid of getting back in the water. What happened to me is a one in a million, actually one in five million incident. Um, and it's a very rare. Shark attacks are extremely rare. Uh, there are only uh, three to five shark attacks each year in the United, entire United States. There are a lot more traffic accidents in the United States. So don't be afraid of going in the water. What happened to me is very rare. And in general, sharks are really nice creatures. Uh, I've seen plenty of sharks out there, and they're, they're nice creatures. I just happened to catch one on a bad day. So, um, oh, I, I did get a picture of one leg. Uh, that's my uh, biking leg. You see, I put my cleat in the middle of the leg. Uh, most, now, most biking cleats are put more toward the, uh, the, uh, the balls of the feet, and that's because um, you generate a lot of power from your, your calf muscles as you push down the leg. If you look at professional bikers, um, you'll see these guys like, like Lance Armstrong, they have massive calf muscles, and that's what they need to climb the hills. But for a guy like me, you don't, you know, calf muscles really don't play into it. And if you have um, the fulcrum point far and far from where your ankle is, um, you lose a lot of energy. So I put the, um, I put the cleat right underneath, or right in line with my heel. And, and then I put the front and back so I could still walk on it. And that's me finishing the, uh, the, the 44 mile uh, bike in uh, Hawaii. Oh, that's the diamond in the background. Oh, skiing. <laughs> so, <laughs> ski leg was interesting. Uh, so I figured, you know, why even have a ski boot anymore? So this is the front, I just took, I just cut the bottom off the ski boot and then attached it to a shock absorber and a little video of me. Thanks. So that's with the new ski foot. A little bit of a 360 there. <laughs> but this is out in Park City, Utah. But so anyway, my point is, uh, with all the wind noise there, my point is that, um, that even if you have amputations, you can still live a very full life. You can still do a lot of things. And these are all prototypes. These are all things. These are so early on. Um, these are things that, that, that uh, we're just starting to, to build. And hopefully, there will be some engineers here in the audience, or some other folks here in the audience, that can take some of this. And you guys look very athletic, and you, know, you guys probably get out there and do sports. You know how sports works. Build a leg for it. Figure out a way to transfer your knowledge of, how, of what you need to do in order to be good at sports. Put that into a mechanical leg. So anyway, I want to thank you guys for coming out here. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm really happy to talk about this.
murky water. Yeah. What's the story on murky water? Well, sharks are ambush attackers. Um, and so I did not know enough, uh, very much about sharks beforehand. But as I mentioned, as soon as people heard about that guy survived a shark attack, uh, I got called by probably every shark expert on, in the world and a lot of interviews. Um, there were a bunch of teeth still on my leg, uh, the, especially the leg and the foot that I'd uh, say. Their teeth come off when they bite. Didn't know that. It's kind of like, like bees with their stingers. Um, and that's how they could tell how old the shark was, how big the shark was, that she was female. They can take these teeth and they can figure a lot about them. Um, but, uh, so other things I learned, sharks are ambush attackers. And so if you, can, if, they, if you see them coming, normally they won't attack you. So one of the things that, that you have to do is you have to establish eye contact with the shark. Um, and but in murky water, you can't do that. And so that's why they like to attack in murky water. Go ahead. Um, have you seen a picture of your foot? Mm -hmm. um, it's a little gruesome. Maybe after if your mom lets you. Yeah. Like you okay, why don't I wait till I have one? Yeah. yeah. Uh, back there. Yeah. Tiger sharks. Tiger sharks. Yeah. What? Oh, what were you first thinking when like you felt your leg come off? I'm sorry, say it again? What were you like first thinking when you felt your leg come off? Like were you like, oh it's here. Yeah. That was well, you know, honestly, I didn't think about it because when it came off, it was during the middle of the attack and so I I I was just so focused on it wasn't until after I, I even I remember think, knowing that it fell off, but then not thinking about it. And then when I finally got back to the surface, when the foot, when the foot floated up, I honestly wondered for a second whose foot it was, because I'd forgotten my own foot had fallen off. And that's when, <laughs> that's, so, you know, it's funny how your mind kind of compartmentalizes things, especially when you're under stress. You just, you just kind of, yeah, it's, it's weird. And, and honestly, that didn't hurt at all when it came off, I think most of the nerves around the surface, so it's the initial bite where most of the pain happened. Go ahead. How were you able to remain calm when you were in the ambulance? Do you meditate or were you sleeping? <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I mean, I think a lot of remaining calm is knowing what's going on. And, um, you know, I, I, I knew what was happening. I knew what my chances were. I knew that I had to stay both. And uh, I could read the, uh, the little, they had uh, me hooked up to some monitors. I could see my, uh, my O2 level dropping. And as everything was heading towards zero, that was, that was concerning. Um, but I, I'm a pretty calm guy in general. I mean, I think that's kind of what it takes to run a startup. Because um, <laughs> yeah, sometimes there are fires going on. Uh, but you know, I, I, I've always been a math guy, and side note. But what I was just saying there, just to stay awake, there's something called the Fibonacci sequence. It's one plus two, three, you know, three plus two, five, five plus three, eight. I was just doing those in my head. And just kind of stay, because I knew I had to stay awake. It's, you cannot let yourself pass out before you get to the hospital. So math saved your life. <laughs> <laughs> study, your, study your math sequences. There you go, study your tables. I, I was 44 years old at the time. I'm 48 years old now. So that was uh, four years ago. Yeah. You have a question? I've seen a shark. Yeah? Did you see a shark in the water? Where'd you see the shark? In the water. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim? Yeah, I, I, amazing story. And, and thank you so much for coming here and sharing it with us. It's incredible. Uh, when you, the, when, when, from the time that the, the shark attacked you to when you were free, how long do you, and, and pulled underneath the water, I mean, how long do you imagine that was? You know, it, it's hard to say. Um, a lot of things I know are because uh, my friend Maz uh, and, uh, and uh, Julian Liverton, the, the guy in the boat, they both had GPS Garmin watches. And so that's how I know exactly where we were uh, between, um, um, uh, between the mokes and shore when it actually happened. That's how I know we were a half mile. And uh, I think it was probably about, you know, maybe only two or three minutes. But I can't really trust my, my own, just a lot of things were happening. And uh, I know he moved me a fair distance because I saw a long trail of blood in the water. And so, um, so from where he, from where she, the first attack happened to where I popped up, 
Um, it was probably 20, 30 yards. Um, but, and Maz was still pretty far away, so uh, I, I don't know how long it took. A any other questions? Oh, okay. You said, um, I know that you're creating a lot of the prototypes, but um, have you started working with any maybe other nonprofits or uh, like Wounded Warrior to help kind of get that out of the market at all? Boy, I am glad you asked that question because uh, that's something I, was, I meant to talk about. Um, there's a group uh, that's called the Challenge Athlete Foundation, and they're actually based in yeah, in uh, in La Jolla. They're based down the street, uh, but they're a nationwide or they're a worldwide organization, and it's an organization that helps raise money so that uh, to buy legs so that um, that that people can can uh, participate in athletic activity. Um, a lot of insurance will cover a leg to walk, um, but um, the, the foundation feels, and I also feel, that there's more to life than just walking around. That being able to go out there and do sport, be able to hike. Th this, by the way, is on the north shore of Kauai. Kauai is in the island of Hawaii. It's called the Nepali Coast. It was a very long hike in, <laughs> and, uh, and it's, but it's a deserted beach, and it is beautiful. Um, but yeah, to me, there's more to life than, than just being able to walk. And, and same with the military. The military provides some legs, but uh, about 30% of the grantees for the Challenge Athlete Foundation are our military guys. Another 30% are kids. And so it's a, it's a really great organization. Uh, we have an annual uh, triathlon, and it's in La Jolla. Unfortunately, <laughs> it was last weekend. Uh, and that's why I'm down here, actually, because I competed in the triathlon. Um, but it will be again next year, and I'll definitely tell uh, Ms. Uh, Jennifer when it is, and um, and so that uh, hopefully if some of you guys can come out, I guarantee you you will be inspired. Um, some of the folks that uh, and some of the things that these folks have overcome is absolutely amazing. This year we had our first uh, wheelchair athlete from Egypt. Uh, she was a, a female uh, in Egypt, and um, you know it's a kind of a repressive society for women. Uh, she uh, um, and they wouldn't allow her to have wheelchairs, and, and uh, so we provided a wheelchair, got her out here, and she was able to compete in the triathlon. And so it was just really, a really amazing sight. Anyway, uh, any more? I just want to say that I did uh, participate in that um, this last weekend, and there's all kinds of events. You don't have to be able to run 10 kilometers or 10 miles. Yeah. <laughs> there's uh, five kilometers. There's walks. It's, it's awesome. It's so inspiring. Yeah, and yeah, and it's um, it's not just for for uh, folks with handicaps. It's it's for able-bodied people too. There are events all weekend. There's uh, there's I think you participate in the yoga. And, yeah, there's uh, yoga. Yeah. You can do the um, triathlon in a relay. So I did the swim section. Someone else ran. Someone else did the bike. So you don't you don't yeah. Yeah. Or you just come out and cheer. And yeah. just come and cheer. It's yeah. really it's really cool. <laughs> Please. Well, I just want to say, so you're getting to know us as well, but I think the student, a lot of the students, to so much makes sense, but probably for about the last 15 years at Country Day, we've done flies four-on-four soccer tournament, and it's been with alumni, students, some years it's in the middle and upper school, but that's all the benefit of Challenge Athlete Foundation. So oh, that's we, you have a lot of built-in fans at La Jolla Country Day School already in great organization and one of the best parts about it is it was founded right here in San Diego yep. but its reach is all the way around the world. I, I couldn't say better. It's, yeah, thank you very much. And, and thank you guys for, for helping us all out. Um, yeah, the money goes to a great place. And well, but you know, hopefully we can try to bring some uh, some other athletes here next year. <laughs> some folks, some real athletes and some folks to kind of tell you about other stories. Um, uh, any more questions? Oh. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was rough. My first day back in the ocean was tough. And, and even now, when I swim in the ocean, I usually, I, every four or five strokes, I check behind me real quick. Um, yeah, yeah it, you know, it, it is, uh, it, was, it was scary going back the first time, but, I, I, you know, it was, uh, it was a real important part of my life to be able to swim in the ocean. I really enjoyed it. And I just didn't want to let something like this, you know, take it away from me. And so I figured I was going to go back in there, and uh, so I, I swim fairly often in the ocean still. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I do check my check behind me every now and then. Yes, I'm curious about the foot that was reattached and how long that process took. 
it's easy to say, oh yeah, they reattached it, but I'm sure that had to be super complicated. And yeah. Learning about the rehab that was involved in that too. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 always been been awful. Um, uh, there have been nine surgeries in three years for this, and uh, and uh, honestly, I'm not sure where it's going right now because um, this is the this is the uh, the left side. The set, they call it the salvage side is the problem side, uh, and that's why I can't stand for more than a few minutes. Um, and you notice what I do is when I stand, I, I basically put all my weight on my prosthetic leg, and I, this leg is just kind of a kickstand to kind of keep me from falling over. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what to do about it. Uh, the, the doctors are telling me to hang on and, and, uh, and it'll get better, but it's been three years already. And but other folks are saying, well, maybe it's better just to amputate it. In fact, a lot of the, there are a lot of uh, dual amputees uh, out there this weekend, and they say, well, you know, just, you just, you know, just go for it. Uh, and from the engineering side, having two prosthetics is actually a lot easier because now I can you know, make two devices and, and do all sorts of interesting things. I have this idea for like a Segway, you know, basically taking the wheels off a Segway and taking a gyroscope so that I can like roll and move forward and just attach it to the bottom. Um, but, but yeah, I just haven't had the, uh, you know, I, I like to tell people, it's kind of like, you know, when I was a kid and there was a high dive and you get up toward the top and you go, okay, I'm gonna jump off that thing, I'm gonna jump off that thing. And you get up there and you look over the edge and you just, yeah, it's it's once you cut off, it's a one-way door, and there've been a couple of times when it's been a long day. I've had to walk through a couple of airports, and my legs hurt so bad, and I just put I have my own picture on speed dial, and I lift my phone, and I just just check it out, and I don't do it. Maybe one day I will. Honestly, I'm not sure. Um, please. Um, with the kind of um, movement that you're offering, you know, with the leg. Um, but do you, I mean, it seems to be kind of the same structure that's been around for a really long time. Do you see it or do you think about changing? Like, just kind of reimagine the whole thing, right? Because yeah. you've kind of just taken the thing that, that worked and yeah. trying to make it better. But do you think there's innovation for maybe just completely changing it up and creating a new product? Yes. I, I yeah, you know the the nice thing about um, well, the nice thing about being an MD is no longer constrained by what God gave you. You know, you now you have freedom to do almost anything. And um, yeah, I, I'm I mean, 40, 48 years old is not young, and so I am constrained by a lot of the way I think by years and years of just doing whatever. And that's why I'm kind of hoping one of these guys who comes in with a completely fresh set of knowledge. You know, whenever people, most of the time when someone wins a Nobel Prize, you know, when you, uh, they just announced the Nobel Prize a couple weeks ago, and they're going to get the awards around Christmas time in, uh, in Sweden. But, and, and you'll see a bunch of white-haired old guys, mostly dudes, unfortunately, they really should be even, but anyway, um, you're going to see a bunch of old white-haired people go up and get the awards. And you're going to think, oh, that's because they did it when they're old. No. They do, most of the groundbreaking work is done when people are young. And it takes 30, 40 years before the Nobel um, Committee deems to give them an award because they have to see how it turns out. But most of the real groundbreaking work is done in your 20s. You guys are getting ready to hit that. And so what, what she said is, is exactly apropos. A lot of things I come up with kind of look like a regular foot. Because that's kind of the way I've been thinking. And it's hard for me to break out of that. We need someone young and someone should just come in there with a totally new way of thinking of things. It does, maybe it doesn't have to look like a foot. Maybe it can look like a wheel. It could look like anything else. Yeah, the sky's the limit on this. Thank you all for being such a great audience. And, oh, and... Back to the very beginning, uh, there's a blood drive next week. Uh, I took eight, took eight quarts of blood to save my life. Please give blood. Please give, yeah. Normal people have between five and eight liters of blood in me. I took eight, meaning I had almost no blood in my body when I got to the hospital. Blood saved my life. Please donate blood next week. <laughs>